Alrighty, good morning. Thank y'all for being here for the Texas General Land Office's public hearing on the Community Development Block Grants for Mitigation Funds on Monday, December 2nd, 2019. It is now 10.03 a.m. We'll go ahead and get started. Please make sure that you are signed in on the sign-in sheet located at the sign-in table right over there. At this time, I'd like to ask before we begin today's meeting, you place all cell phones and other communication devices in silent or off mode. This public hearing is intended to seek input on the development of the State of Texas's action plan for $4 billion in community development block grants for mitigation funds allocated for the State of Texas for mitigation programs, projects, and planning in areas affected by Hurricane Harvey, as well as the 2015 and 2016 floods. Starting right after my call to order, the Deputy Director of the Community Development and Revitalization Division will give a presentation on the mitigation funding. When she concludes, we will transition to our public input from our attendees. If you wish to provide public input during today's public hearing, please complete a comment card at the registration table. It looks like this. You're welcome to complete a card now, or if you think of something that you'd like to say later on, please make sure to fill one out and have our staff members come and grab the card here, and as well as in the audience. If there's any questions or comments about the GLO's disaster recovery programs that are currently operating, please make sure to email cdr at recovery.texas, spelled out, dot gov or give us a call at 1-844-893-8937. In addition, you're welcome to come visit with us after the hearing concludes. So, for the public comment, each individual speaker has up to three minutes to provide their input. A delegation of five or more individuals can appoint one person to present their views for up to five minutes. For those who would like to provide public comment, please make sure to step forward to the X marked here on this floor in front of the projector. Our host, Keith, with the Aransas County Navigation District has a microphone for you to speak into. Please be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Any persons choosing to speak in this public hearing are consenting to online publication of their comments. Once we get through all of the comment cards and there are no longer any individuals present who would like to provide input, we will conclude this public hearing. If it does not last until our projected 2 p.m. close, we will conclude prior to 2 p.m. And welcome any further input again at our email cdr at recovery.texas.gov. Due to the format of this meeting, it is a public hearing intended to garner input from our attendees about the State of Texas Action Plan for Mitigation Funds. We will not be able to hold any discussion or answer any questions due to the format of this hearing. Again, the intention is to garner input to incorporate into the action plan. Therefore, please make sure that all input is provided in the form of a statement. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Deputy Director for CDR, Heather Legrum. Um, this is considered a public hearing, uh, so we're going to be listening to you. Um, we are looking for uh, your thoughts, your ideas related to the action plan itself. If you'll remember, we came down, oh, probably about two months ago now, and visited with you about what do you need from us? What would you like this action plan to look like? We tried to compile everyone's ideas into this document. And it is our hope that um, you can kind of see us reflecting some of those suggestions that you had made to us in the plan. Unfortunately, because it is a public hearing, we don't plan to interact with you directly. If you have questions of us, we will be here afterwards. And we can talk about the particulars of your specific issues, your specific questions. Uh, the only thing that I will do is if there seems to be a clarification necessary, I'll pop back up and talk a little bit through something that maybe I didn't cover as well that you may need some additional clarification on because there's no reason for y'all to be thinking something's bad if it isn't. So let me, let me clear that up for you if possible. So like Jonah said, we're with the land office. 
Um, Y'all have seen all of these pictures, and I'm going to jump through some of these. Uh, the Federal Register itself was published on August the 30th. That Federal Register uh, was nearly two years in the making. The, the Congress actually appropriated those funds to us um, pretty quickly after Harvey, but then it took a little while for HUD to figure out exactly what mitigation meant. And um, there were some discussions in D.C. amongst many of the agencies because we were stepping on each other's toes, it seemed. So the allocation to the state of Texas is $4.2 billion. There are 140 counties eligible for this because it is eligible for 2015, 2016, and 2017 or Hurricane Harvey disasters. What that means is, is um, some counties, uh, as the Jasper County judge told me when we were see visiting with him not too long ago, have the trifecta of disasters. And they're going to be eligible for every single program that we're putting out under this action plan. So if you w were impacted in 15, 16, and 17, there is a possibility that you will submit three applications for three different programs for mitigation efforts. The action plan itself is due to HUD on February the 3rd. So if you are a 2015, and some of you may actually be um, affected by 2015, I know that uh, Rocio County is. If you were impacted by 15 or 16 or Harvey, then you're going to be eligible for these funds. And there's a handout at the back. If you didn't grab that handout at the back, um, better than the maps even, on the back of that handout, there's a list of each county and which particular events you qualified for. To qualify, that means that you had a disaster declaration through FEMA for that event. And I don't intend to read these slides to you, but I do want to read this one in particular. This one the land office had nothing to do with. This is how HUD is defining disaster, I'm sorry, defining mitigation as opposed to disaster recovery. So mitigation per HUD are those activities that increase resilience to disasters and reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of loss of life, injury, damage to and loss of property and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. This is extremely critical in how the action plan was developed. HUD did not allow us to look at the damage that you sustained. This is not a backward looking program. All of these dollars have to consider a future risk associated with, it, with these funds. So whereas all of you who are applying currently for your first tranche of the Harvey mitigation funds, I'm sorry, the Harvey disaster funds, you are having to have that direct tie back. You're showing exactly what Harvey did to you to be eligible for these funds. This one is a forward look. You're looking forward at risk, in particular, risk related to hurricanes and or flooding activities. Some additional rules that HUD has placed on the funds. 50% of that $4.2 billion has to be spent in counties, that HUD, counties and zip codes that HUD has defined as most impacted. This is a calculation that HUD did. This is not a number that we had anything to do with. It's based on housing damage related to Hurricane Harvey 2016 or 2015 events. Again, in your, in your handouts, but this map, the darker shaded orange areas will receive 50% of this money. 50% of this money can also be spent outside of those most impacted areas. It doesn't have to be, though. So we can spend 50% or more in the dark orange or up to 50% in the lighter orange colored areas. 
50% of the money, the $4.2 billion, must be spent within the first six years, with 100% of the allocation being spent in 12 years. 12 years sounds like a whole lot of time, but the expectation is that these projects are going to be larger scale projects that are likely to involve uh, very uh, detailed environmental reviews. Uh, we're likely to involve the Corps of Engineering and specific permits under the core project methodology. And those of you who have worked in that environment know that those things can take some time. It's likely that you will also be doing projects that will result in large-scale acquisition. And acquisition can be difficult to get through, um, be it a voluntary or an involuntary process. 50% of the money has to be spent on projects that qualify as low to moderate income. So in most cases, these dollars will be spent on infrastructure or buyout type projects. So what you'll be looking for is service areas that in the majority are benefiting low to moderate income people. And I talked about this a little bit already. I didn't want us looking at the damage that we had sustained during those three events. They wanted us to look at how this um, risk is going to go forward for the state of Texas. To do that, we looked at the state hazard mitigation plan and we looked for risk associated with what are called the FEMA lifelines. As it concerns the, the use of funds, we first identified the programs and the program criteria that were going to be necessary to solve those risks that we identified. From there, we determined amounts of money to populate those, uh, those dollars and developed a method of distribution. Within the entire document, you will see us, because HUD pretty much mandated it, uh, that we are promoting local and regional long-term planning. We're promoting coordination and leveraging of funds. So again, looking for larger scale projects that are partnerships, that are a big bang for the buck, is what HUD keeps saying in the presentations that they do when they're talking about these funds. We do want to see a promotion for natural infrastructure where it makes sense and we want to ensure construction standards. We're looking at your, anything that you describe to us as a project as a, to ensure that there is long-term operation and maintenance available for these, fun, for these programs. If you, if you have a project, we can build it for you, but we cannot maintain it for you. So in perpetuity, we're looking for how is this project going to be maintained? And then we're looking to assure that construction costs are reasonable. This is not as strict as a FEMA benefit cost analysis, but there is a connotation of benefit costs being considered as we're looking at projects. So this is a quick timeline that identifies for you the plan forward. Um, we are starting that 45-day public comment period and it will end early January. Within that, that next two weeks, every single comment that we receive from you, be it verbally here or something that you mail in to us or send to an email address, will be um, actually put into the action plan itself <coughs> with a written response. So while I told you that today we won't be able to respond to all of your feedback that you give us, in our document you will see that's that response back to you. And then it goes to HUD for submission. On February 3rd or before, we're going to submit this action plan for HUD approval. And HUD has told us that they need 60 days to approve that. So that means about April 1st, we should have approval of the action plan. HUD told us that we had to do uh, four total public hearings, two before and two after. I think we're up to nine now. Texas is a huge <coughs> state. Um, we didn't want to make everybody come to Austin. We wanted to come to you and spread these out so that they would be more convenient for you. 
And we are taking public comment online, so I know some of you might be a little bit shy about coming up and offering public comment. You can definitely go online and do that there. Another thing that HUD has told us that they want to see with these program dollars after the action plan is approved it is, is a citizen advisory committee, a committee of folks who were impacted by the event, who know what's going on locally, who can help us out with progress throughout the grant. Once the action plan is approved, we plan on um, bringing together these, this advisory committee and or committees, because again, Texas is a big place, um, to start talking about our progress and using um, that committee to help us move the programs forward. Like I mentioned, there is no tie back requirement on these funds. If you apply as an eligible applicant under 2015, you do not have to define how that particular project that you are applying for was caused by or an issue during 2015. You do have to identify how it relates to hurricanes and or flooding mitigation. Of course, it has to be CDBG eligible, and it has to meet a national objective. 50% of the money on the LMI national objective. So under the infrastructure side, you're gonna see us encouraging you to do regional investments. That encouragement is by way of the competition programs having higher minimum grant amounts than you've ever seen before. For 2015 and 2016, the minimum grant that you can apply for is $3 million. That is $3 million per project. For Harvey, that amount is $5 million. So that is definitely encouraging you to think bigger in the projects that you're looking for. The projects that you're looking for can be things like upgrading water, sewer, solid waste, Communications is a big one that we keep hearing again and again as an issue. Um, energy, transportation, health and medical, and other public, public infrastructure. And then multi-use infrastructure is also possible. Green and natural mitigation infrastructure is always encouraged. On the housing side of things, we didn't think that HUD was initially going to allow us to do housing with these funds. They had initially told us that we could use these funds for the mitigation aspect of a house. So we could pay for the elevation, we could pay for the storm shutters, and we could pay for the windstorm protections, but we couldn't actually pay for the construction of the home. Uh, we pushed back really hard, and the commissioner followed up on it as well, and HUD changed that. So now we're eligible to put together a program that will do funding of houses that include mitigation measures. So we can build the house and elevate it now. We have set aside money particularly for the homeowner assistance program in this region. Y'all are oversubscribed in that program. So the money that we're putting from mitigation will allow us to go deeper into that oversubscription wait list that we've already <coughs> established. Buyouts are considering, considered a housing activity by HUD, and we will allow for buyouts in our programs. We are not setting aside money, particularly for buyouts, however, based on the response that we had to the buyout program that we did with the first five billion. Flood proofing of any sort is likely to be eligible. And then the hardening of single and multifamily units is also going to be um, a, an eligible use. Economic development is technically eligible, but if you read all of those details, this is not really economic development. This is more hardening of the commercial areas and facilities to ensure that your businesses are uh, mitigated from a risk perspective. This is not money to businesses generally. Planning and public services are eligible uses. Planning is going to be a really big one with these funds. We definitely wanna see you doing planning activities. 
that um, are considering that mitigation and that risk that are um, definitely going to be a part of, uh, of our tex of Texas as a whole, I guess I should say. Um, you're gonna see opportunities to update your local mitigation plans, your local codes, your local um, zoning, those types of things. Your GIS data can be updated. Those are definitely things that are gonna be considered here. Public service is a little bit harder to do with these funds um, because it's tough to do a public service that's going to solve a future risk. Uh, public service is a soft service of sorts. So think about things like education and outreach related to buying flood insurance or how to harden your home. Um, those types of things could potentially be eligible. We still cannot do buildings for the general conduct of government. No city halls, no courthouses, no emergency operations centers. Uh, you could perhaps make those facilities more resilient and harden them, um, but that would still be um, something we'd have to look at case by case. No forced mortgage payoffs. This has not really been a problem in Texas, um, but we have seen it in so, some other states where the mortgage company actually says that they will not allow the homeowner to rebuild from the CDBG funds. They want those funds to retire the mortgage instead. So HUD closed that loophole and that's not allowable with these funds. This one doesn't make a lot of sense to us and we've pushed back pretty hard on this one um, and we may ultimately ask for a waiver from HUD. But we cannot enlarge a dam or a levee beyond its original footprint. If you're thinking mitigation, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's definitely not a logical restriction. Um, and there is no assistance to private utilities. HUD has identified a new project type. It is a covered project. It is a $100 million project with at least $50 million coming from CDBG. Realistically, it's just a project with the big price tag on it. Um, and it has to go into the action plan. So if you're applying for $100 million, which you could in some of these programs, it may be a bit of a delay to get you to your contract because we have to amend the details and the specifics of your individual project into an action plan document. And there is some consideration for benefit cost analysis uh, as it relates to that project. It's a little more stringent. Again, we're looking at, um, from a needs assessment perspective, risk associated with hurricanes, tropical storms and depressions, and severe coastal and riverine flooding. So those are the other perils that would have been potentially eligible, uh, but we have focused these dollars on just the top two. In looking at how to allocate the funds, one of the, one of the criteria that we looked at is a, um, a composite disaster index. Historically, exposure to six event types was considered. They're ranked and weighted by the exposure of that disaster type and it identified areas of Texas that are most likely to be impacted by future disasters. And then as you can see, um, the shading there indicates uh, how that looks. And I believe this is in your handout as well. If it's not, it's definitely in the action plan. Okay, so these are the programs. These are the different programs that are going to be eligible for uh, participation in, you'll see that we have uh, two programs specifically set aside for 15 and 16. Those are both competitions. Uh, then we've got a Harvey competition. We're going to allocate funds to the regional councils of governments and ask them to do a method of distribution. We are supplementing the HMGP program with Texas Department of Emergency Management division now of emergency management. 
The Coastal Resiliency Program is a program that has been um, funded or will be funded that keys into the state's GLO master plan, the coastal master plan that many of you participated in. The housing oversubscription supplemental. I don't know why we didn't just call that the homeowner assistance program number two, but that's what we called it. This is for the homeowner assistance program wait list and oversubscription. We're doing a resilient home program. This is a program that will look at alternative ways to harden and strengthen homes. So this program is going to go deeper into the homeowner assistance program, but we're gonna build more resilient homes that are a little bit different than a conventional house. Hazard mitigation plans. This is gonna be for all three events, opportunities for communities to apply to update your HMGP programs and plans. The Resilient Communities Program is that program that I talked about earlier to help with updates to zoning and building codes and ordinances and that type of stuff if that's something that you're interested in. And then also the um, planning dollars are going to be available for all three. For 2015, HUD identified about 50 million, 46 million, um, as the amount of money the state of Texas was getting for our need or our risk associated with 2015. So we did the very same. This is a $46 million program. It is same as before, 50% going to HUD identified most impacted areas. Maximum award amount is $10 million, minimum three. Um, eligible applicants are going to be cities and counties, excluding Houston and San Marcos, because they both got direct allocations from HUD. Indian tribes, the COGS, in the 2015 eligible areas. And again, we're looking at infrastructure for hazard mitigation to include a housing activity buyout and acquisition. Very, very similar, 2016, the amount is 147 million. All things are exactly as the same, um, other than the dollar amount. Hurricane Harvey's competition. This one's definitely a little different. Uh, first off, this is a $2 billion competition. 50-50 split, HUD most impacted. Um, a hundred million dollar maximum and a five million dollar minimum for these projects. We've opened up the eligible applicants somewhat to be cities and counties, Indian tribes, COGS, state agencies, service districts, ports and river authorities. And again, focusing on hazard mitigation through infrastructure, buyouts and acquisition. <coughs> Okay, so the first particular program I'm going to tell you about is the Regional Mitigation Program. This is what we call the COGMOD money. This is the money that's being allocated to the COGS for local distribution. It is going to be eligible for um, infrastructure and buyout activities uh, pertaining to mitigation as always. The minimum award amount is going to be $3 million and it is 50-50 HUD most impacted. And you will see the 50% LMI come out in this method of distribution your COGS will be creating. This is how the money splits out. These are the COGS that were eligible for Hurricane Harvey. We split it 80% to the most impacted HUD areas, 20% to the state impacted areas within each of those allocations. These allocations were based on that mitigation um, risk factor that I talked about earlier, that disaster index, a social vulnerability index, a taxable um, per capita value, and population. The hazard mitigation grant program is a plus up to the hazard mitigation uh, grant program that TDEM runs. 
So um, TDM received about $890 million uh, for HMGP, conventional HMGP, the one that, that y'all have all applied to. They received close to $2 billion in applications. So we're going to put another $170 million in that program and just go deeper into that list of selected projects that um, they have put together at TDM. Uh, it is for Hurricane Harvey, and we are looking at um, opportunities to choose projects that, of course, are CDBG eligible. And if you, looking at what TDM has considered, there's acquisition, demolition, demolition, elevation, community individual safe rooms, retrofitting of facilities, structural hazard control, emergency generators, and code enforcement. The Coastal Resiliency Program is based off that coastal master plan that the GLO put together. It's a $100 million program, and it's going to look at projects that were identified in that master plan and fund those as direct allocations. I think I've talked to you about this one quite a bit. This is $400 million going to the Homeowner Assistance Program that will plus up the areas that have over subscriptions related to that Homeowner Assistance Program. And this is the um, Resilient Home Program. This is the Innovative Housing. Again, this is a plus up to the Homeowner Assistance Program, so there's about $500 million going into that Homeowner Assistance Program to deal with the oversubscription rates that we already have. Hazard mitigation plans, there's $30 million, and that is, this one is for all three, 15, 16, and Harvey eligible counties to apply for. This is to uh, update your hazard mitigation plans locally. <coughs> to be eligible for a lot of the FEMA funding, you have to have a current and up-to-date hazard mitigation plan. So this would help you to do that um, using the federal dollars. Resilient communities, this one is related to um, codes, zoning, um, uh, ordinances, all of those types of things that you put into place locally to um, make the construction more hardy and more resistant to risk. This is a maximum of $300,000 per community and you can um, apply for up to $100 million total in the program. There's $214 million that's been allocated for regional and state planning activities. And everything eligible under planning will be allowed from these funds. So here's a really quick cheat sheet that kind of explains um, who's eligible for which, which of those programs. And that's also in your handout. And with that, my job is done. And Jonah is back up. And your job begins. Thank you, Heather. So we will now transition to our portion of public comment where we take public input from our attendees. Again, please make sure to fill out any public comment cards in here and make sure that it gets to one of our staff members who can bring it to me up here in case you have any input. To start with, we will have Aransas County Judge Bert Mills. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Uh, I understand that I have three minutes. Yes, sir. Well, I've got about 12 pages here, so I'm going to highlight it. I do have copies to give to you, okay? We're here to talk about the GLO receiving $4.2 billion from HUD. And its main purpose, the focus is on uh, planning for flooding and flood control in the future. Uh, as required by the Federal Registry this year, at least 50% of these funds must be 
in support of the benefit of LMI persons. And all programs will have an LMI priority. In our opinion, this plan falls a little short. But it's identified Randy's County as one of the most heavily impacted counties. We are one of 23 impacted counties, and one of 140 eligible for these funds. And the term used was most impacted. Notice required that 50% of the application must be addressed and the identified risk within these areas up to 50% may be addressed and identified risk within the most impacted areas. The amount was allocated was $2.1 billion, well, over $2.1 billion, or 49.91%. However, the GLO plan took 50% of that and designated for statewide competition. And only 500,000 of the 2.1 billion was shown as distributed to the COGS in the most impacted areas. The post Bend COG, which we're a member of, got 76.9 billion per million, which is of the 500 million. Our fundamental question is why ground zero of this event only being allocated 76.9 million, which is to be shared with 43 other governmental entities in our code. The state action plan allocates 214 million for state administration. This is over two and a half times the amount allocated for the entire coastal pen area. And that was ground zero for Hart. Our, just for Aransas County, we are looking at $62 million for projects that are needed to fully fund direct storm impacts. And another 40 to $50 million for resiliency projects. Again, Aransas County was one of the 23 highly impacted counties. From the perspective of Ground Zero, we agree with HUD that more funding is needed than is planned by the GLO. We certainly don't mind comp competing for the funds, but in our opinion, it causes delays and un unnecessary increases in the cost of the frontline governments like Aransas County. These increased costs will be or items like engineering, technical, legal guidance, management, and administration, not so in the ground construction. In our opinion, the delay in the causing of local jurisdictions to spend far more than the projects really cost. We need help now. We've already waited two and a half years. The last thing we need to do is continue waiting for funding and credit projects and endless competitive processes for more staff time and more delays. Critical projects, recovery projects in Aransas County like Little Bay Restoration, Cold Harbor Bulkhead, and our fiber optic blue networks, to name just a few on the balance of the state in action and endless delays. Why doesn't the plan take a direct approach, allocate the funding to the local jurisdiction, and help us move the projects forward? Skip over some of this. Uh, it's obvious <coughs> that you and your plan are trying to spread out the funding. While this is commendable, this approach will not be effective in solving the recovery problems the money was provided to help us correct in the first place. From the perspective of Ground Zero, why don't you fund local plans and priorities first and then allocate based on documented needs? Once this is achieved, spreading out the remaining funds would be fine. In our opinion, spreading the dollars to resolve political issues instead of storm issues is not. The, the, the delays caused by this process will increase costs, miss key priorities, and damage our recovery efforts. Again, two and a half years is long enough. Why can't these dollars assist us? We, uh, and I'll get through all the gravy here. But all these pages, I've come up with this one thing that I need to say. Aransas County was ground zero for Harvey. If the 
history is any indicator we'll be ground zero again in the near future. God forbid. We need your help to prepare. We need the GLO to hear us and follow through. With your support, we can prepare projects within the next three or four months that can help us for the future of Texas Coast. It will not take years, so please don't forget us about our request and prepare the final state action plan. We can help us, if you can see, in our obvious perspective, no more costly delays. Let's join together and make future the Texas something that the Texas can be proud, proud of. Thank you. I have. Some. Thank you, Judge, for your public comments. Up next, we have the Francis County Navigation Chairman, Mr. Malcolm Nackow. Thank you for hosting us, sir. Well, first, I want to thank you uh, for coming and uh, holding these uh, public meetings. I want to echo everything that uh, Judge Mills had to say. We of the Navigation District uh, fully support uh, these efforts, and I, I think we cannot overstate their importance. We have some con additional concerns, however. Uh, one being that as a navigation district, uh, the bulkheads, board, uh, breakwaters and such, uh, which are the first line of defense, uh, fall within our purview. And we want to make sure uh, that special districts, such as the Aransas County Navigation District, uh, qualify. Uh, at this time, uh, our bulkheads, uh, some of them are in severe need of repair. And quite frankly, uh, practically they cease to exist, particularly in Cove Harbor, which is a low mod designated area. Uh, we have breakwaters, uh, which need to be expanded and also need to be repaired. Um, all the good things that are done, the rebuilding of the inland structures, which is so very important. Um, if we have another storm, and uh, we don't have adequate bulkheading, and we don't have adequate breakwater uh, water. Uh, homes are gonna flood and be destroyed. Businesses are gonna flood and be destroyed. So we need to make sure uh, that Aransas County is adequately uh, protected and uh, that the funds uh, are made available to us. I would hope that, uh, and I recognize, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about Houston and Galveston and the big boys up there, that uh, those of us who live in the smaller uh, coastal areas will get sufficient funding and not be forgotten because the citizens who live down here, uh, they need the protection. And the navigation district, along with the county, the cities, are fully committed into providing that protection when and if the funding is made available. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. <laughs> Up next, Noises County Judge Barbara Canales. Gotcha, she stepped outside. We'll give it a moment. Up next, we have our New Aces County Judge, Barbara Canales. Apologies for interrupting your phone call. I'm sorry? Apologies for interrupting your phone call. Oh, that's all right. That was just Commissioner Chesney. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> always take your commissioner's phone calls as a county judge. Well, I wanted to say good morning, and I apologize. I'm a little under the weather, but uh, on this beautiful day here in Aransas, I wanted to bring greetings from New Aces County. I wanted to thank Judge Mills, just had him in the size, there he is. And say that this is um, the second hearing that I'm able to participate on behalf of Moises County and really just came to reiterate our regional perspective that we in Moises County share here with Commissioner Modest, Commissioner Vaughn in the back. And we really came to 
declare once more our regional interest in partnering. We think that the dollars that are available are good dollars, are strong dollars, but we see an alignment in our region. And even though I did step outside to take that call, I was fascinated by the concept of what we could do together if we were to put a regional breakwater uh, concept or you know, coastal resiliency plan together. And I'd like to urge our partners in Aransas San Patricio and Nueces to work together in order to build this package. I think that it would benefit the coast. I know it would benefit, um, in particular, our three counties. And I think that together we are clearly uh, could put together an incredibly strong um, program or portfolio, if you will, for the GLO to consider. I have been a little unclear on some of the what's in and what's out. And so I do want to just reiterate how much I appreciate uh, the questions that we have being answered so quickly. And um, through Simone and, and some of the contacts we've had in our office for our grants department, we are working together to understand the rules the best. We, um, we have done a little bit more due diligence on, in the refinement of our projects. And I know Scott Cross is here through Coastal Parks. And, we are very fortunate to have our coastal resiliency plan have a project with Shovel Betty that we will be submitting. <clears throat> this has to do with Pack Ridge Channel. Having said that, there is a tremendous disadvantage that some of our regional partners have. Noises County, for instance, is already in the process of updating our hazard mitigation plan and will be complete by February 1. However, when you really look to see how some of your dollars are, being aligned, you're basically saying, hey, come apply for these dollars to update your plan. Well, I want to share with you that I'm not in this situation, but I have tremendous empathy for people who don't have the plans already. That's a backwards thinking in my approach. I mean, why would you want to spend money for a plan that you already, I mean, we need to be working on projects that the plans have already identified. We do not need to, I mean, obviously, if you don't have a plan, um, it would be important to do so. But again, these dollars are really meant to make us resilient now. So I want to encourage our regional partners to get your plans up and going before this April uh, 1, or maybe it's now going to be May 2020 appropriation. This is very, very critical. And I think it almost sends a strange message that you should wait to get your money to do your study. No, do your study now. Get your reimbursement provisions in. Do not wait, and if you need to partner with us regionally, we're going to do that with you. Um, I'm also mindful that I just saw Danielle Hale here with the port, and to the extent that we can partner with what I call non-traditional governmental entities, but still political subdivisions, we want to seek those partnerships too. But our port benefits multiple counties, including San Patricio and Aransas. So don't forget that when you're espousing these projects in your right judgments, this is a vulnerable area, but you're not going, you're going to benefit when we partner here together. And, uh, and I can see that this would be a benefit to the general land office too, that they wouldn't have to choose one county over another that was equally as vulnerable, equally as effective, but they could choose a regional approach. And that's really what I wanted to reiterate with all of you today. As far as the emergency um, services that will or will not be uh, considered eligible activities. We've had this discussion, but I really believe that at our last mitigation hearing, that we had said that fire stations would be included, and they are, because there was definitely some uh, misunderstanding, but if they are, okay, that, that helps. I, I can now eliminate that email from the inbox, and, uh, and I appreciate that, because again, we seek as a county to partner with our cities to find ways that we can be helpful to one another. So with that, let me just say that uh, we welcome you back to the Coastal Bend, and, uh, and we look forward to, to these extensive partnerships. But, but make no mistake, those of us that are lucky enough to have the plans, we're going to be in a, a huge advantage. And I'm worried about my friends. I'm worried about us regionally. And so I'm going to really reiterate that we need to partner 
up because if you don't have a plan, you shouldn't be punished um, that you don't have a project to advance is within that plan. That's a, that's a tremendous concern for me. Um, lastly, and, and certainly this is probably our number one priority in Wessex County, and that is if you're going to talk about studies, we're going to put a lot of eggs in a drainage study. But this drainage study does not know borders, and it certainly doesn't know county boundaries. And I think when we're looking at, at drainage studies, you really ought to consider the basins. And so whether it's Nueces or Nueces Bay of Gaga or San Antonio, here's what's strange. When you talk about flooding and you talk about medication and flooding, you have to, rec I want the GLO to remember that our basins are not connected. So for instance, I would love nothing more to partner with the Nueces if they're not in the same basin. Now that's, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, so there's going to be a situation where, again, I don't want to see arrays get punished, I don't want to see noises get punished, because our basins are not connected, that we would have been perfect partners, but we're not going to be because of the way the hydrology works. So having said that, I think that you will see U.S. has put forward those activities that have already been identified in our hazard mitigation plan, then and the updated one, that will be presented in February. Those projects that will be in the Coastal Resiliency Plan through Coastal Parks, already part of our overall master plan. And then again, where we can, we'd like to reach up into our basin partners and put forth a very strong, not cheap, very, because none of these projects are economical projects when it comes to drainage and flooding. I think you're guiding us there, but I'm certainly looking for some input that's what I see. But I am concerned that our partners up the coast might be by the crow flies 20, 30 miles, are not going to be a natural alliance for us um, in, in this regard. And so that I want the GLO to really consider that because I know that when we look to spreading the well, you're going to be looking for those projects where we can align. We cannot align where the basins are not connected. And I suppose speaking to the choir, but I just want to point that out for the record, and to also my partners here in San Pat. And so I don't know what we're going to do about that, but we would look for guidance from you all on how we can partner uh, when we don't share bases. So with that, thanks again, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with you regionally, as always. Thank you, Judge, for your public comment. Up next, we have Council Member Ann Nyberg from Ingleside on the Bay. Good morning to everyone on such a beautiful day in the coastal plan. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to speak. My name is Ann Nyberg, and I'm a newly elected council person from Ingleside on the Bay, most commonly known as IOB. I also spoke back at the hearing in October in Corpus Christi. I appreciate the 300-page document and the information it, can, it contains to help us manage coastal resources for the resiliency of IOB. It is refreshing to know that my words were heard even though I come from a small community. It assures me that our democratic process is alive and working. I am also impressed with how quickly you have worked through all the comments and had your report finished in such a timely fashion. I like your eight specific issues of concern with several of those certainly impacting our community of IOB. Figure 2-73 on page 159 gives an informative approach to the multiple lines of defense. We will certainly use this document in the days to come as we continue to read and understand this long, lengthy document. We are a small community with paid, limited paid staff. In fact, our staff are all part-time and both shared with other communities. Henceforth, a lot of the work to maintain our city is through volunteers. Why, just the other day, City Council person Susie Wilder, another resident, and myself cleaned up a pile of debris that was left after Harvey. Our concern that was that the pile was growing instead of being removed. That is just one example of projects from Harvey that still have not been fixed, including our street signs. Each of these projects is waiting for volunteers who have the time and the health since our community has a large population of elderly to accomplish the tasks of our city. 
Now, do not get me wrong. We are a proud community and not afraid to jump in and help out our neighbors and city. We have groups working on abandoned dogs and helping with yard work for those who can't physically or financially do it themselves. These are small projects that do not require large amounts of capital. However, for those projects that are necessary for making us resilient from flooding, drainage, storm impact, bay shoreline erosion, abandoned or derelict vessel <coughs> structures and debris are very expensive and cost prohibitive for a community that gets most of their operating budget from property taxes. As a city council, we are being diligent with our budget so to have the resources for unexpected events. To summarize, we need some of this HUD money to be a thriving, resilient community along the coastal bend to support and give a safe, quiet place for people to live and work who work in the many industries in our area. Please keep us in the communication line so we can continue to access the resources that are out there to help a small community like IOB. I'm just a small school teacher, just a retired school teacher who moved to IOB to be close to family and get away from the hectic DFW lifestyle. In the process, I fell in love with my community and felt a compa passion to get involved and help my city. My calling for teaching lasted 40 years, and now my calling for public service, and now my calling is <coughs> public service, with my learning curve being fast and furious. Please remember IOB and our needs as you allocate the generous amount of money that the great state of Texas has received. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Council Warren. Up next, we have Council Member Randy Kane from the City of Ingleside on, on the Bay. On deck, we have Catherine Maston, the Chair of the IOB Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I heard what you said at the beginning about questions. Mainly what I have are questions, so at the end I'll just leave this with you, but I, I think I wanted just to say a couple of things. I'm also a board member at, a, uh, at the Ingleside Beach Club, and we're a nonprofit. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, because we didn't apply, uh, is there an opportunity for uh, revisiting uh, the PMA uh, HM uh, GP supplemental so that uh, those who aren't quite on the list yet, uh, because we're constantly being flooded, might get looked at it. So that's one of the first questions on here. And I guess the only other thing that I really want to bring up is that my main concern is that the, the city of IOB is, is treated fairly. And I, I uh, appreciate the, all of the structure that's been put into this. But I, I think that it might be uh, beneficial to everyone if, the, um, if there was a little bit more focused on oversight for the COG mods. And because there's not a lot of documentation in here about what might go on with those mods, that uh, there uh, be a little bit more put into that. For example, um, uh, maybe that the, the way that the COGS uh, uh, make their notifications of their public comment period uh, be uh, fleshed out and made a little bit more robust, like a, a more direct communication with the COG representatives and, and perhaps extending the period that the public comment goes on to 30 days uh, since we're a, a little bit more uh, informal than that. And I guess that's the main thing, and I'll just leave this with you. And uh, thank you for the time. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Catherine Master, the chair of the IOB Planning and Zoning Commission. On deck, we have John P. Jackson. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Catherine, Dr. Catherine Master, chair of the Ingleside on the Bay Planning and Zoning Commission. It's great to see the variety of the project opportunities in the action plan, including the Resilient Communities Program. However, um, I, as has been expressed, I'm also concerned about project applications from IOB potentially being at a disadvantage in the scoring competition for these reasons. Uh, number one, our city government is made up of volunteers, not dedicated uh, paid urban planners, so this is new for us. Two, our proposals are likely to be for smaller amounts due to our community's size and rural location, although we'll be open to the partnerings, I'm sure, so. Um, and then coastal communities, uh, are small, are cost more to live in uh, inherently. So our population does not meet the LMI thresholds. Uh, but we're not wealthy either. We're working class. Um, and the plan emphasizes only natural hazards. I know those are the top two hazard priorities. Um, 
but our 60-year-old waterfront community of about 700 residents faces natural, natural risks from flooding and storms that are exacerbated by these rapidly increasing man-made hazards, including our location on two ship channels that are being deepened, increasing size and frequency of ship traffics and wakes that cause coastal erosion, tank farms uh, that are vulnerable to lightning strikes, and oil and gas pipelines all around us. So I have some questions and suggestions. Um, and I know you can't answer, or maybe you can, but uh, when will this state, statewide database and mapping and modeling tools be made available to us? And how will this be communicated? Um, and I, I appreciate the addition of the resiliency, the mitigation resiliency measures to the scoring rubric for the Hurricane Harvey um, plan. But the total point count on page 222 in the document is now 105 points. I didn't know if that was intentional. That maybe it should be 100 points. And then going on with that scoring rubric, there were 20 points for the LMI score on page 222, and I wondered if that was an all or nothing, like you either meet the LMI or you don't. That's 20 points out of 105 as it sits right now. And on page 264, it states uh, under the national objective part that all funded projects must meet a national objective for either number one, urgent need mitigation, the UNM criterion, or the LMI criterion for benefiting the LMI, low to moderate income persons. So if that's the case, if I'm understanding that part of the project plan, um, I would suggest that the 20 points currently being proposed um, uh, only for LMI, that that be changed to be either for LMI or UNM. And the uh, statement, that would mean that the statement on page 264 that all programs and projects will have an LMI priority, that that statement could be eliminated. And I also wondered if, the required, if it was a requirement from HUD that at least 50% of all the funds will be used to support activities that benefit LMI persons. If not, that might be adjusted as well or eliminated. And then I was also concerned on the scoring report about the tiebreaker being poverty rate. When it comes to mitigation, as I think you're hearing, you know, the emphasis should be more on the problem at hand, you know, what we're dealing with down here in the coastal band, or the level of need and or the likelihood of project success. And these are often very different um, and not related to poverty. And another question in the scoring rubric is, are the scores for project impact all or nothing? You know, and what per person costs and percentages should we aim for? We don't have a you know, sense of that, what, what would make us competitive. So my hope is that GLO will find ways to ensure that small rural coastal communities like IOB can compete on a level playing field for CDBG MIT funds by removing the irrelevant criteria uh, maybe offering bonus points for innovative responses to mitigation challenges that are arrived at in partnership with universities and industries, or demonstrating how a community can lift people up out of poverty by offering safe and affordable housing near coastal industries. So in, communities like IOB serve as desirable residential areas within commuting distance for a growing workforce to support the oil and gas industry, for example. Having, having a good paying job <laughs> offers a direct pathway out of poverty. However, when communities like ours are threatened by hazards, both natural and man-made, property values come. Without mitigation, we run the risk of becoming more like the urban ghettos that HUD is trying to stomp out and in some cases, coastal communities will be decimated or just disappear. These CDBG MIT grant funds provide a tremendous opportunity to innovate and implement ways to ensure that the Texas coastline continues to offer vibrant, resilient places to live and work for many years to come. Thank you for the work you've put into this plan. We look forward, we look forward to being kept in the loop as developments occur. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.
Arts. Up next, we have Donkey Jackson. And please make sure everybody has any input, public comments that they would like to make. I don't have as many up here as I would like. So if you guys want to fill one out and get one to one of our staff members, that'd be wonderful. Sir, go ahead. Thank you. As you said, I'm John P. Jackson. I represent a multi-generational family and business here in Aransas County. Currently also involved in an establishment of the Economic Development Corporation and hopefully will join our regional partners in that endeavor. As you know, Aransas County was directly in the eye of Hurricane Harvey and clearly suffered considerable damage to homes, businesses, and public infrastructure here in Aransas County. No doubt about that. I went through all of my life and personal experience five hurricanes, but none of them matched Harvey in magnitude and damage. My family actually came here in the late 1800s and lived through the historic 1919 storm, which practically wiped this community off the face of the earth. But Harvey's impact was much larger financially, and consequently, this community was severely set back. But after this storm, we were so fortunate to have a well-prepared and efficient long-term recovery plan which well-documented what needs to be done to return to Rancis County to its pre-party status. It is my understanding, though, that a significant portion of our recovery plan may not take place due to lack of funding, which may be diluted and spread out to other coastal areas up and down the state which were not nearly as severely impacted as Aransas County. As of the present time, our community is working well together like never before to get behind our recovery plan with the establishment of an economic development corporation, which will hopefully bring together public and private funding to fully execute on this plan. We've been waiting for two and a half years to receive our proportional share, which we strongly believe should be allocated where it is needed most in the path of the storm most negatively impacted by Hurricane Harvey. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Patrick Nye, the president of the IOB Coastal Watch Association. On deck, we have Shauna Brader, a business owner. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you again. I was in Corpus Christi here about a month ago, and thank you all. I'm here to represent myself and my wife, Julie, who came with us, as well as the Eagle Island Bay Coastal Watch Association formed this year. And we were formed so we can study what's going to happen to our community. I'm the president. We have several executive officers here and other people that are in the organization. And I just wanted to let, uh, let you know that we are looking forward to working with y'all so that you can support our projects going forward. As we all know, all of our communities in this beautiful area here was devastated by Harvey. And not unlike these other communities, we were without power, without sewer, without utilities and, and so forth. But with the aid of our city council and mayor, uh, Amon, and others that stepped forward with the uh, HUD, uh, let's see, we had FEMA and AEP came with all the different people around the country that came and put our infrastructure back together. That was a critical point in our lives. But the most vivid memories to me were how neighbors helped neighbors. We have a resilient heart there. And we want to continue to do this, and we want to work together to come up with a plan that we can mitigate our, our lives going forward. Dr. Philippe Tussaud, he's with the uh, Conrad Blucher Institute. He's an associate research professor at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Uh, is a study, he does studies on sea level rise around the world. He says Ingleside on the Bay is looking about a third of an inch per year now. And that's without any kind of glaciation melt in Antarctica or Greenland. And within five years, those numbers could change. We could have a global uh, catastrophe instead of just a local. What I want to make a point, though, is that he says that nuisance flooding, these king tides, as they're calling it, the seasonal tides we had just this October 19th, were 2.08 feet at the Lady Lexington. The tide gauge at uh, Naval Station Eagleside, which is now Moda, was knocked out by a, a vessel and has not been in place. So what we don't know is really what happened there at Eagleside. But we had substantial flooding. And this flooding is going to continue. The nuisance flooding is not like the linear projection of what our sea level is going to rise. It's going to be logarithmic. He states that in 2000, 
Let's see if I get my numbers here. Let's see, in 2035, right now it's an 8% chance to get a three foot tide. Three foot tide would knock out most of our infrastructure down in the lower areas of Ingleside Bay, probably in North Beach as well. Uh, but by 35, there's a 24% chance of having a three foot tide. That's one every five years. By two, uh, 2058, it's a 50-50 chance. So every other year, we'll have a three to four foot tide. If you put a tropical storm hurricane in the Gulf, what happens to our, our tides then? Of course, they get much bigger. But Ingleside is unique. We have tankers. We have this, these production, uh, big production uh, LNG ships. We have, uh, you know, the port getting deeper. That displacement alone, we're seeing six inches on top of these flood stages. We're getting flooding every year, and it's going to get worse. We have to address these issues. So, having grown up on the Eagle side the last 52 years, the last 37 as a geologist, I've been watching this stuff. Not, it's been perceptible coming up. We can see these tides coming up. And I think the data is overwhelmingly supports that we need to make a change, at least in the Eagle side of the bay, and I'm sure in all coastal communities along the Gulf Coast. What we are taking this uh, knowledge firsthand, and what we have done, is we've hired a wonderful engineering firm, Mott McDonald. Stephanie here, I think she said she's going to be here. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us. They are contracted to do a sea level mitigation study for our area, from not only Ingleside on the Bay, but all the way around the Cove area. They recently uh, put a draft together for the La Quinta ship channel deepening and widening. And so they wrote the book on this area. They know what the effects are going to be. They know what the tides and the storm surge and the flood, uh, the nuisance flooding is going to happen. So we have hired them and attracted them. And we are going to have a plan by uh, February 1st for you to, to look at. These plans will include uh, different conceptual designs, the potential costs, and so forth. And so we're working forward to make this plan um, going forward. So, you know, I think there's some great questions that Catherine put forth and Randy about uh, the 200, 300 page document. I didn't read it all, but I know that it was well written because I, I saw some of the summaries of it. And I just want to say that, you know, I guess the question is, how does a small community like ours fit into the scoring uh, categories? I, I don't know how that would work. And um, how, how do we fall into the category that we have seasonal flooding, we have yearly flooding. You know, how does that work? I mean, we are going to have these tropical storms and hurricanes, but how does our community work in that type of uh, point system? Thank you all. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Hannah Miller, Executive Director of the Rockport Cultural Arts District. This is my last card. Therefore, if anybody would like to fill one out, oh yes, Keith. You'll follow right after. If anyone would like to fill one out, make sure to get it filled out and get it up to Simone or Shannon up there in the front or one of our staff members up here. Thank you. I was at your um, last mitigation meeting in October and um, learned quite a bit, so I felt like um, it's really cool that y'all came to our small community and, and offered to do this here. Um, I'm here um, as the executive director of the Rockwell Cultural Arts District. I'm a fourth generation and I also own a small business here in town. <coughs> Um, I would just like to make a comment about looking forward. Um, you say this is a looking forward plan. Um, so I'd ask that you look at the unique relationships between local government, um, our property owners, and our business owners. Um, as someone in the cultural arts district, I, I see a lot of our business owners having to close out or struggle um, because they weren't eligible for the funding because they weren't the property owner. Um, and so just being able to communicate and disseminate this information to them in a way that's understandable for what projects they're able to partner with, whether that's through our local government, um, whether it's through uh, them partnering together, putting something together, but just making it easy to understand, easy to disseminate, um, and easy for them to apply for um, these projects, because a lot of them could use um, mitigation funding for um, flood proofing or hurricane proofing, and those would be great uses of funding um, for these small businesses in low-lying areas. Thank you for your public comment. My name is Keith Barrett. I'd like to make my public comment on a couple of items. You know, we've talked about the, the personal hardships that, that these flooding and things uh, bring. 
But the bottom line is we need to get this money rolling towards the coast for hard projects. And what I mean by that is we have to pour concrete, we have to bring in stone and steel to hold back these waters. And as if any of you have done any marine related projects, you know that is very expensive. But it's going to take projects like that to harden our coast against future onslaughts of tropical activity. We've seen the evidence of what happens. This very building that you were in was wiped out by Hurricane Harvey. All of the sand and land around you was gone because of Hurricane Harvey. The water does not care what demographic or what your social status is. It will wipe out anything. But what I will say is I, I'm a little concerned with the LMI issue. The reason is, if you think about the coastal region, all of us in this room, we live in a coastal community. It's not cheap to live here. We're not going to be able to adhere to a lot of these LMI issues. If you think about anywhere along the coast, whether you're on a river, lake, stream, bay, or Gulf of Mexico, that is some of the most expensive land in our state. So right there, it puts us out of a lot of these mitigation funds that we're going to need to harden our coast for future events. That's what we're talking about. Hardening our coast for future events. We can't do anything about Harvey, Celia, Beulah, Allen, or any of the hurricanes that we had in the past. We're talking about the future. And so we can sit around and wait until the next hurricane season and the next disaster hits our coast or we could get this money on the street and start building projects. We here in Aransas County, the judge, the navigation district, and others like us, we have shovel-ready projects. If you show up with a dump truck full of money, I can build some stuff. We are ready. But what we're posturing, we're trying to get ourselves in position, and we're trying to qualify. We're using so much of our time our sweat equity, trying to get ourselves qualified, then what's not happening is the hard projects that we need to put on the ground. Breakwaters. For example, the lady that was just speaking, Hannah, in the downtown historical district, those breakwaters will protect those. What's going to lie behind those breakwaters is the new courthouse, the new city hall, the fire department, the police department, the EOC, all of that lies behind those protective breakwaters. And if we don't get these things ready for the next event, then shame on us. We didn't, we have our time to prepare, but we have to get the money rolling quick enough that we can help save ourselves. And that's what we're trying to do by making these applications. Other than that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have a County Commissioner, Charles Smith. On deck, we have Rockport Mayor Pat Rios. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, just echo the sentiments of men who spoke in front of me. We're sitting here 27 months after the storm. We received no money from any of the GLO's projects. No. And this has been gone through two subsequent hurricane seasons. It's all about hazard mitigation and protection from the farm, but we've already wasted, in my estimation, two years. And, and, and the sad thing is we're probably six to nine months away from receiving any funds. So let me be three to three and a half years. So the timeliness is a huge factor for me. And our business community could use a big shot in the arm from the construction projects that we could get underway with today. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Rockport Mayor Pat Rios. Well, thank you. I want to thank the committee for, for coming. I'm very appreciative of the public uh, turnout. And what I'd like to do on behalf of the city of Rockport is just assure everyone here that we've been working since way before the storm in Francis County, the Resil Resiliency Initiative Committee working on projects, identifying projects. It's been going on for years prior to Harvey getting us. Uh, we've stepped up that effort. 
I agree with Judge Canales and Judge Mills about our regional approach because we need to look at this as we're all in the same boat. And we look at look that ties would arise all ships. So we look at this opportunity to partner our, our community, uh, but we realize that we just can't work as individuals. We have to work together. And we right now are looking to team with the GLO and uh, accomplish our goals. We know what they are. We know what we've got projects all over the community. And we just uh, want to let you know that the city of Rockport, along with our partners, are ready to answer any questions to move forward with anything that you might need to help us move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That was the last public comment card that I had received. I'll give it a moment if there's anybody else who would like to fill out a public comment card. Mario, you want to go ahead? Yes, sir. We'll get to Mario. Thank you, Keith. I'll fill out a card as soon as I'm finished. I just want to send a message back to Commissioner Bush, thanking him for allowing y'all, dispatching y'all to come to this coastal region. I know that y'all have a busy schedule to wrap up the year. God bless y'all. But most importantly, thank y'all for taking the time to come and let him know that we do appreciate the very simple fact that he is recognizing not only the problems along the coastal area, but most importantly, the great state of Texas. So thank you very much for being here and taking the time. Safe travels back to Austin. Thank you for your public comment. With that, I see no movement for further public comment cards to be picked up and filled out. Therefore, as indicated at the beginning of this hearing, uh, once we reach the end of our public comment period and all of our public input, we will conclude even if it's prior to 2 p.m. So we want to make sure to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for taking the time on the Monday right after Thanksgiving holiday to be here with us to listen to presentation about the programs and projects that may be eligible for Arendt County and other coastal bend entities. We hope that we hear from you all. Thank you all for the public input you provided. And just like Heather indicated before, if there are things that you do think of in the future that you would like to provide public comment on, any concerns, any questions, any comments, we do welcome them at our email at cdr at recovery dot texas spelled out dot gov. And we will hang around for a little bit. Uh, we do have our next engagement coming up with Dave Moran's ribbon cutting. So thank you all so much for being here. God bless.